Julian Assange and Chelsea Manning are in prison. Get all of the details here. What's in the news with stories on harm reduction, military recruitment, animal cruelty, incarceration crimes, potty problems, and bad boys. Finally, an Ask Me Anything segment where I answer your questions on psychological experiments, working for theft, Scandinavian socialism, and more. This episode is brought to you by Health Excellence Plus, a health share that has saved my family thousands of dollars and can save you money too. Also brought to you by ForkFest, the third annual decentralized libertarian camping event that happens right before ForkFest, with no tickets and no one in charge. Welcome to The Lava Flow, channeling the flow of information to the libertarian, anarcho-capitalist, voluntarist, and agorist community. Find us at thelavaflow.com. Here's your host, Roger Paxton. Thank you for joining me this week from the state that has three of the best hospitals in the world. According to Newsweek magazine, this is the show that will bring you the people, places, and events that everyone in the Liberty Rebellion needs to know. You can catch me on Twitter at the Lava Flow Pod. This is episode 127, Heroes in Prison, and it's Tuesday, April 16th, 2019, when there have already been more than 254 people killed by police this year. And the United States debt clock shows us that more than $22 trillion, $207 billion, $800 million in debt. What's wrestling my jimmies this week? You're about to find out. Let's do it to it. Julian Assange and Chelsea Manning are in prison for the despicable crime of shedding light on government misdeeds. So the government doubles down and kidnaps them, which is even more government misdeed. First, let's talk about Assange. The WikiLeaks founder, Julian Assange, was arrested in London to face a charge in the United States of conspiring to hack into a Pentagon computer network in 2010, bringing to an abrupt end a seven-year saga in which he had holed up an Ecuador's embassy in Britain to avoid capture. The Ecuadorian government suspended the citizenship it had granted to Mr. Assange and evicted him, clearing the way for his arrest by British authorities. His hosts had displayed growing impatience, listing grievances including recent WikiLeaks releases they said interfered with other states' internal affairs and personal discourtesies, like the failure of Mr. Assange to clean up the bathroom and look after his cat. A bedraggled and shackled Mr. Assange, 47, was dragged out of the embassy. At court hearing, a judge swiftly found him guilty of jumping bail, and he was detained partly in connection with an American extradition warrant. Mr. Assange indicated that he would fight extradition, and legal experts said that that process could take years. He's likely to argue that the case is politically motivated rather than driven by legitimate legal concerns. Mr. Assange's arrest brought to a head long-simmering tensions that have raised profound First Amendment press freedom issues. Since Mr. Assange began publishing archives of secret American military and diplomatic documents in 2010, provided by the former Army intelligence analyst Chelsea Manning, senior officials in two administrations had weighed whether to try to put him out of business by charging him with a crime. Mrs. Manning was convicted at a court-martial trial in 2013 of leaking those documents. The Obama administration had explored whether to bring these exact same charges against Mr. Assange, but decided not to, in part because of fears of creating a precedent that could chill traditional journalism. But in November, an accidental court filing that I talked about here on the show appeared to disclose that the Trump administration had secretly charged him with some unspecified offense. That indictment has recently been unsealed, however, revealing that prosecutors in Northern Virginia had not charged Mr. Assange under the Espionage Act for publishing government secrets. Instead, they charged him with conspiring to commit unlawful computer intrusion based on his alleged agreement to try to help Ms. Manning break an encoded portion of passcode that would have permitted her to log on to a classified military network under another user's identity. That encryption was never broken, and Manning was not able to log in as that other person. Because traditional journalistic activity does not extend to helping a source break a code to gain illicit access to a classified network, the charge appeared to be an attempt by prosecutors to sidestep the potential First Amendment minefield of treating the act of publishing information as a crime. 
Nevertheless, journalists should still be warned, said Barry Pollock, a lawyer for Mr. Assange. Mr. Pollock said, While the indictment against Julian Assange disclosed today charges a conspiracy to commit computer crimes, the factual allegations against Mr. Assange boil down to encouraging a source to provide him information and taking efforts to protect the identity of that source. Journalists around the world should be deeply troubled by these unprecedented criminal charges. And he couldn't be more correct. The implications of this for the First Amendment protections of the press are chilling. Unfit to fucking exist. Edward Snowden, a hero in exile, went to Twitter to talk about this. He said, The weakness of the U.S. charge against Assange is shocking. The allegation he tried and failed to help crack a password during their world-famous reporting has been public for nearly a decade. It is the count Obama's DOJ refused to charge, saying it endangered journalism. And, of course, the Miss Manning of this discussion is Chelsea Manning, the Army whistleblower who released hundreds of thousands of pages of classified documents to WikiLeaks in 2011 and who called attention to war crimes committed by U.S. troops. She's been held for more than a month so far for an indeterminate period of incarceration because she refused to testify before the WikiLeaks grand jury. And to make matters worse, she was reportedly held in solitary confinement, or as Sheriff Dana Lawhorn called it, administrative segregation, until April 5th. What Manning is doing, in my view, is heroic for myriad reasons. There is no need to rehash what she, then Private First Class Bradley Manning, did in 2011. You don't have to like Chelsea to acknowledge that she's a whistleblower. Yes, she seems to be a strong progressive politically, or hell, even a socialist. But there's a legal definition of whistleblowing. It is bringing to light any evidence of waste, fraud, abuse, illegality, or threats to the public health or safety. That's exactly what she did when she downloaded and delivered to WikiLeaks thousands of pages of government documents that exposed the real truth about the American wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. The most damning of these for the government were the collateral murder video, the Afghan war logs, the Iraq war logs, and the Guantanamo files. And in my opinion, these actions are heroic. She put her life and liberty on the line to bring information to us on immoral actions committed by our government. But the price that she has paid has been very high. Manning spent two years of her seven years in prison in solitary confinement, a situation the United Nations has characterized as a form of torture. She twice attempted suicide, the first time that she was in solitary, and she was forced to remain naked for a year in solitary because she was considered a suicide risk. Authorities were afraid she would use her clothes to hang herself. In early March, Manning was subpoenaed to appear before a grand jury in the federal court for the Eastern District of Virginia. The media reported that the Justice Department's prosecutors wanted her to testify about her relationship with WikiLeaks co-founder Julian Assange and how she was able to pass classified documents to him in 2011. Manning contended that she had already testified to those questions in her own trial in 2012 and that all the feds had to do was enter into the record the transcript of her trial. The feds wouldn't relent, of course, but neither would Manning. She said she would invoke her Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. Then the government offered her qualified immunity. Nothing she said before the grand jury could be used against her, except if she contradicted her 2011 testimony. Now, that's a trick the feds love to use to charge people with perjury or with making a false statement. Manning held firm, however. Even with the qualified immunity offer, she said that she would invoke her First Amendment right to freedom of speech, her Fourth Amendment right against illegal search and seizure, and her Sixth Amendment right to due process. She wouldn't budge, and the Justice Department asked the judge to hold her indefinitely in contempt of court. That is how Manning finds herself behind bars yet again. Now, Manning could have simply answered each question with, I don't recall. She would have been home in time for dinner. Instead, she made a political point, one that all of us should want to emulate. The point is, don't tread on me. The point is, I'm willing to jeopardize my freedom to protect yours. Now, I know that I personally don't care for her politics, and I certainly don't care for Assange's personality, but that in no way diminishes their actions, in my opinion, though. These two are heroes for their actions, and now, like Ross Ulbricht, they are jailed heroes. We should be loud in our exclamations that they be released. We should be loud in our declarations that these kidnappings are immoral. 
we should be loud in our contempt for the government continuing to try and cover up for their crimes. Look, don't sit on the sidelines and allow this injustice to happen under the shade. Be loud. Shine light on the cockroaches. Don't let the bastards get away with this shit. Have you subscribed to the Lava Flow on iTunes or any mobile device yet? Then what's wrong with you? Go to thelavaflow.com slash subscribe so you don't miss a minute of the show. And while you're subscribing, make sure to leave me a five-star rating and review the show to help others find our podcast. Thelavaflow.com slash subscribe. What's in the news? The news you need to know from a libertarian perspective. In harm reduction news, the founder of Silk Road 2 was sentenced to five years and four months in prison for his role in running the online drug marketplace. In 2015, Wired published a list of the dark web drug lords who got away. That list included the Dread Pirate Roberts 2, DPR2, the creator of the second Silk Road site, which launched almost immediately after the FBI ended the first with the famous arrest of founder Ross Ulbricht. Under DPR2, Silk Road 2 went on to rake in hundreds of thousands of dollars a day. The FBI shut that one down, too, and arrested its remaining administrator. By that time, DPR2 had already passed ownership of the site on, and publicly, it looked like he had evaded prosecution. But a court in Liverpool, England, sentenced Thomas White, a technologist and privacy activist, for crimes committed in part while running Silk Road 2 under the DPR2 persona, among other crimes committed under another persona. White pleaded guilty to drug trafficking, money laundering, and was sentenced to a total of five years and four months in prison. White's arrest took place in November 2014, but the cases remained largely under wraps because of the UK's strict court reporting rules, which prohibit journalists from covering some cases before their conclusion. This is to stop suspects facing trial by media and in order to let their cases run their course. Freedom of the press, indeed. Look, guys, you know the drug war is much less healthy to people than drugs, period. And this is just further proof. Here we have someone who used his knowledge to reduce harm from the drug war, and he's going to sit in a fucking cage for years because of it. Typical of the drug war. The drug war is not a war on drugs. It is a war on people. In Wars and Rumors of Wars news, it seems that fewer Americans want to serve in the military. Thank Rothbard. Donald Trump's three-quarters of a trillion-dollar defense budget request submitted to Congress last month contains a dirty secret, one that should make us all think twice about perpetual war and public support for it. The youth of America don't want to serve in the military anymore. The situation has become so dire that just to maintain America's ground forces, the Army and Marine Corps, the two services are resorting to unprecedented pay raises, bonuses, and socialist trappings. And things are going to get worse. This year, for the first time ever, Americans born after September 11, 2001 will be able to enlist in the armed services. It's a sobering reminder both of how long we've been at war, but also how distant those very wars have become from America's youth. And yet official military polling shows that fewer and fewer young Americans consider the military as a career or even as a transitional step. Only some 12.5%, the lowest number in a decade. That 12.5% number is bracing, but based on complex math that balances losses from deaths and injuries, retirements, attrition and discharges, the Army and Marine Corps only need about 100,000 recruits to maintain current force levels. That's just about 2.4% of the 4.2 million Americans who will celebrate their 18th birthday this year. And yet the military is looking at its third or fourth year in a row where it will struggle to even find those numbers. In order to attract a sufficient number of those who are able to serve, the Pentagon spends $1.6 billion on recruitment alone. And this year, the Army is offering new recruits bonuses of up to $40,000, as well as incentives that include student loan repayments. After decades of consistently managing to fill its ranks, even the Marine Corps has had to start offering cash enlistment bonuses. And in 2017, the Marine Corps lowered its standard and handed out over 25% more medical, mental health, recreational drug, and misconduct waivers to be able to reach its enlistment goals. The Army and Marine Corps have also revised their advertising campaigns, focusing more on social media and trying to rebrand. 
For the Marines, that means battles won advertisements that focus on military history instead of the current go-nowhere wars. To appeal to women, the Marine Corps also is trying Battle Up, its first commercial ever to feature a female fighter. Meanwhile, the Army has adopted the new slogan, Warriors Wanted, to replace Army Strong. Look, millennials are getting this one right, folks, and I couldn't be more happy about it. When you have even the Marine Corps lowering standards, you know there are some serious implications of this, and I love it. It gives the Marine slogan of the few, the proud, even more meaning, especially the few part. As most of you know, I was laid off from my 9-to-5 director of IT job last summer. Among the many terrifying things about losing your job is losing your health benefits. Our family went about six months without any kind of health insurance, and the anxiety and worry that came along with that was not insignificant. But after spending dozens of hours researching our options and quickly rejecting the $2,000 a month price tag that came with the options available with traditional insurance, we found Health Excellence Plus, a health share that was a fraction of the cost, and we're glad we did. Only a few weeks after joining as members of this health share program, my wife was diagnosed with a common skin cancer that requires an expensive procedure to remove the cancer and another surgery to repair the damage done from the cancer removal. When this is all said and done, Health Excellence Plus will have saved our family thousands of dollars. And I'll bet they can save you money too. Health Excellence Plus is a health share that meets the requirements of the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare. A health share is a community of like-minded, health-focused members who have joined together to share each other's medical costs above an amount they can comfortably afford. A health share is not traditional health insurance. It is designed to be a catastrophic coverage for major items, like my wife's surgery. The cost of an average family insurance policy for a primary 45 years old with a $5,000 deductible is $1,450 per month. A Health Excellence Plus $500 initial and shareable amount with a health care strategy is only $783. Get started saving money today at thelavaflow.com slash health. That's thelavaflow.com slash health. In fishy news, a North Carolina man was charged with animal cruelty and abandonment after leaving his pet, fish, in filthy conditions. The fish's owner, Michael Henson, was evicted from his Wilmington, North Carolina home last month and left the fish behind in a dirty tank with no food, authorities said. The six-inch-long fish was found at the home last week, and authorities took it to the Fish Room, a shop that sells pet fish and supplies, where it was discovered that the fish was suffering from hole-in-the-head disease, which causes lesions. Hey, wait, I think I know lots of people who have that disease. Shop employee Brett Edwards said, It's amazing this fish survived. I have personally never seen a case this bad. Edwards said that the fish had about 15 holes in its head when he was brought to their store last week. Now the fish just as dense where the holes had been. Edward said fish developed the disease by being left in very, very poor conditions for quite some time. The fish had to survive by eating cockroaches that fell into the tank, according to Edwards. Henson, 53, was charged Wednesday with one count of abandonment of an animal and three counts of misdemeanor cruelty to animals. Sheriff's Office Lieutenant Jerry Brewer in New Hanover County said it's the county's first animal cruelty case involving a pet fish. But this is a life like any dog or cat, he says. I wonder if next week they're going to arrest someone for eating tilapia. In incarceration news, a federal court this week sided with an inmate who sued the Texas prison system to get a cotton blanket after repeatedly telling officials that he was allergic to the standard-issue bedding, which he alleged is made of recycled waste that caused him to have open sores. For 10 years, Calvin Weaver has been asking prison staff for a cotton blanket, but officials refused, so last year the Harris County man took them to court, representing himself from inside the Terrell unit in Rusheran Prison. The prison system responded with a motion to dismiss, but on Friday, U.S. District Judge Kathleen Hoyt ruled that the suit can continue. Even though Weaver won't be entitled to money from the defendants in their official capacities, Hoyt wrote, he could get injunctive relief. Essentially, a new blanket. Hoyt wrote, These defendants' argument that replacing Weaver's blanket is beyond their power because they're not medical doctors is disingenuous. 
It appears from the complaint that each of these defendants is in a position of authority and could, presumably, order that Weaver receive another blanket or that he receive a medical evaluation. This problem that sparked the legal wrangling dates back to 2001, when prison medical staff diagnosed Weaver with a wool allergy, according to court papers. At the time, they gave him a medical pass that allowed him to get a cotton blanket. But then in 2009, the pass wasn't renewed when all the blankets system-wide, both the standard-issue wool ones and the cotton alternative for allergy sufferers, were replaced with non-wool blankets made from what Weaver describes as a blend of recycled waste. But the non-wool blend allegedly made Weaver itch, break out in open sores, and lose sleep. For nine years, Weaver asked for another blanket, complaining repeatedly to officials all the way up to the agency executive director. He filed grievances, noting that he knew of at least 10 to 15 other prisoners at his unit who'd received cotton blankets. Officials and medical staff ignored his complaints, the federal judge wrote in his recent ruling. So now, the state of Texas has wasted nearly a decade, and no telling how many tens of thousands of dollars fighting this in court, instead of giving this guy a fucking $10 cotton blanket. Typical government solution to a simple problem. Fuck these guys in the neck with a steel wool blanket. Join liberty-minded voluntarists, anarchists, and libertarians this summer from June 13th through June 18th for ForkFest 2019 at Rogers Campground in the beautiful White Mountains of New Hampshire. ForkFest happens right before the Porcupine Freedom Festival, and ForkFest is decentralized, which means that no one is in charge. This also means that there's no ticket cost. Just reserve your camping or RV site or motel room with Rogers Campground for June 13th through the 18th. You can simply relax and go camping with other Liberty lovers, or you can create whatever experience or event you'd like others to have. If you're planning an event for ForkFest, be sure to let others know in advance. You can connect with other ForkFesters via the unofficial Telegram chat or the ForkFest forum. Links to both of those are on the unofficial website, forkfest.party. That's forkfest.party. This is the third year of this event, and I have attended all of them so far, so I hope to see you there this year. Get all of the information at forkfest.party. In potty news, a pregnant mother was cited by police after her three-year-old urinated in a parking lot on his way to the bathroom. What the actual fuck? As parents of toddlers know, nature doesn't always call at the most convenient time. Trust me, I know. Brooke Johns was driving in Augusta, Georgia, when her three-year-old son told her he was in urgent need of a bathroom. She pulled into a gas station parking lot, only to realize that they wouldn't make it to the restroom. Johns was 34 weeks pregnant at the time and couldn't carry her son, Cohen, to the toilet. So she tried to cover her son up as best she could while he peed in the parking lot. Johns said he was peeing before his pants were even all the way down, so obviously he had to go. But law enforcement wasn't so sympathetic. Imagine that. A Richmond County Sheriff's deputy witnessed the incident, which occurred March 29th, and cited Johns for disorderly conduct. The officer wrote on the ticket, She allowed her male child to urinate in the parking lot. I observed the male's genitals and the urination. Public restrooms are offered at the location. Oh, no. Poor cop saw a witty bitty pee-pee. Sure hope this asshat doesn't have any kids. Johns now faces up to 60 days in jail and a $5,000 fine. The mom, who is expecting a baby girl next month, plans to head to court April 30th to contest the citation, just days before her due date. Johns said, accidents happen, and the officer was like, take them in the bathroom. What if I had ran to the bathroom and someone had been in there? What was I going to let them do, pee on the floor of the gas station? Yes, the cop apparently would have preferred that outcome, it seems. What an asshat. This is a guy with a power trip and a badge who was clearly so upset that he saw the three-year-old had a bigger cock than he did. In Bad Boys news, the family of Ayanna Jones, the seven-year-old girl who was shot by a Detroit police officer in a botched raid in 2010, has settled a civil suit with attorneys from the city of Detroit for $8.25 million. Ayanna Stanley Jones was fatally shot by Detroit officer Joseph Weekly in May 2010 during a botched police raid. In the middle of the night, police came through the door of a home on Lily Bridge on Detroit's east side in attempts to locate a murder suspect. In all of the chaos, Ayanna was accidentally shot 
while she was sleeping on a couch. This case went to trial twice, and Officer Weekly was ultimately acquitted in both trials. Of course he was. Attorney Jeffrey Figer took up the civil case, and it was expected to start next week in Wayne County. But the city attorney's office said the case was settled for $8.25 million to be paid to Jones's family by the city of Detroit. The settled deal must be approved by Detroit City Council next. Following the second hung jury, Prosecutor Kim Worthy opted not to pursue a third criminal trial against Weekly for careless discharge of a firearm, which is a misdemeanor. So, during a botched raid, a cop murders a seven-year-old girl. The peers on two separate juries could not convict such an act because the fucker in question had a badge. And now the taxpayers are on the hook for $8.25 million? Sounds about right in today's police state. Fuck this cop, the juries, and the rulers of the city of Detroit in the neck with a botched raid. Ask me anything. Roger will answer your questions about, well, anything. Do you have a question for Roger? Email AMA at thelavaflow.com or add your question to the latest AMA thread in the Pax Libertas Productions Facebook group. It's that time again. I'm going to answer your burning questions. Remember, you can ask me your questions by adding it to the thread that I post in the Pax Libertas Productions Podcast Fans Facebook group or by emailing me at AMA at thelavaflow.com. Or, if you're awesome as fuck and you support the show, you can ask me your question in the Lava Flow Super Supporters Facebook group, or in Patreon, or in the posts that I put in Subscribestar and Bitbacker. So, let's jump into the questions. Longtime supporter and friend, Daryl W. Perry, has three questions. First, how are you liking DDP yoga? Do you have a favorite workout that you're repeating? Favorite instructor? Anything else to share about it? You know, I really like it so far. I can tell that my strength and endurance have gone up tremendously already, especially after shoveling six carts full of chicken shed and pine shavings for the compost bins this weekend. I don't really have a favorite workout or instructors yet, but I'm still going through them all, and eventually I probably will. Daryl's second question is, thoughts, if any, on the Netflix documentaries The Push and Sacrifice by Darren Brown? I enjoyed both of these from an observational standpoint. I think these were very controlled experiments that were fascinating to watch. However, I was concerned with how this might mentally impact the unwilling participants in the long run. I mean, I know they signed releases, but they did not know how impactful this might be, so I'm not certain the releases absolved the creators of the show from repercussions. Hopefully, if there are any repercussions of this, the creators will eventually make that right. And Daryl's third question is, what are your thoughts about the ethics and morality in general of psychological experiments? You know, like I mentioned, as long as there are signed releases that go over everything in detail, and the creators of the experiments are willing and able to cover any damages involved, I don't see any issues with these sorts of experiments. The big thing in these that I think might have been missing in the Darren Brown experiments is informed consent. The participants must be fully informed or any consent or contract that they sign should or could be invalidated. I would be curious, for example, to see any consents that were signed during the Milgram and Stanford experiments. Thanks for the questions, Daryl. Joseph C. asks, During the recent government shutdown, I made a claim to some family members that working for the TSA is an immoral job. However, I also tend to think that many American soldiers are deceived, victims of the state's propaganda and warmongering. Where do you stand on this? Is it ever a morally sound choice to work for the government? What if, for one reason or another, one cannot find sufficient work elsewhere but still needs to provide for one's family? What about firefighters? We'd like them to not be funded coercively, but I can't recall a time anyone complained about firefighters violating people's rights, unlike cops, soldiers, or TSA agents. You know, this is a very tough question for me to answer. I have two very close friends who currently work for the federal government, one in the Navy and one in the passport office. And I know both of them are listening to this episode right now. I fully understand having to support your family, but that argument goes away when you realize that it is much harder to get a government job than a private sector job. It is, however, much easier to keep a government job than a private sector job, so there is that. The way I see it, taking money for a job when you know the money is coming from coercive means is immoral. This means that having a job with the government when they take the money by theft is immoral. 
I also say that taking a job with a mafia is immoral for the same reasons. This also includes government firefighters, postal workers, etc. Now, having said that, I also include things like Medicare and Medicaid. For the last 10 years or so, I worked in healthcare information technology. My paycheck in the first job was at least 75% government healthcare money and around 50% in the other job, even though both jobs were in the private sector. Does that mean that it was immoral for me to take that money? Yes, I believe that it was. It was something that my wife and I struggled with when I was in both of those positions. Thankfully, though, I am no longer in that situation, but I know how tough it is. I know it's a tough one, and I know that both of my friends in this position struggle with this the same way that I did. I was fortunate to get out of it, and I still hold out hope that one day both of them will be able to get out of it as well. Thanks so much for the question, Joseph. The next question is from Christopher O. He asks, Both those who love and those who hate socialism, democratic socialism and social democracy, struggle with what to call what we have in Scandinavia, Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. In Norway, the experts call it social democrat Fuck, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it translates to social democratic mixed economy. The leaders of Liberalistine, a truly monarchist political party without parliamentary power currently, like to say that it isn't socialism yet, and they're glad. What say you? Is it appropriate to call it socialism? So, Christopher, I think what you have in the Scandinavian countries is socialism light, much like what we have here in the U.S. Are there some parts of the government that are socialist? Yes, just like in the U.S. In the Scandinavian countries, like all other developed nations, the means of production are primarily owned by private individuals, not the community or the government, and resources are allocated to their respective uses by the market, not government or community planning. While it is true, though, that the Scandinavian countries provide things like a generous social safety net and universal health care, An extensive welfare state is not the same thing as socialism. Even the prime minister in Denmark once said in 2016, I know that some people in the U.S. associate the Nordic model with some sort of socialism. Therefore, I would like to make one thing clear. Denmark is far from a socialist planned economy. Denmark is a market economy. And he's right. And this seems to hold true in the rest of Scandinavia as well. Thanks for the question, Christopher. William Burkeen asks, I'd like to hear a fuck insert here in the neck montage. Can you make that happen? Oh, man, William, I fucking love this idea. Sadly, I just don't have even close to the time to make this happen. I would, however, not be sad at all to see a listener or someone else do a montage like this. Have at it, guys. And finally this week, Philip F. asks, Stout or IPA? Stout all the way, baby. Thanks for the question. So since I only have a couple of questions left in my queue, I'm going to be opening up the queue for more questions. By the time this episode releases, you can ask your questions in my new threads in the Pax Libertas Productions fan group on Facebook and my Super Secret Supporters group on Facebook. You can also email me at ama at thelavaflow.com with your questions. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you for listening to the show this week. As always, I need to thank my favorite chicken poop scooper, Jessica, for her help with the show. For the show notes to this episode where I put links and other information that's been on the show, go to thelavaflow.com slash 127. I have a new supporter this week. Andrew D. became a $5 per episode supporter through Patreon. Thank you so much, sir. You rock. So, thanks to all of my awesome supporters, I am at $258.75 per episode, or 51.75% of the way towards my next goal of $500 per episode. Thanks for all of your support, guys, really. And remember, when I hit this next goal, I'm going to be upping the content that I bring you from half an hour per week to a full hour. I know you want more content from me, and I want to give it to you. So, add your pledge today to help me bring you twice the lava flow that you're getting today. So exercise your free market muscles by going to thelavaflow.com slash support and giving me a per-episode donation of as little as a buck an episode using Federal Reserve Notes through Patreon, or monthly using Subscribestar, or using cryptocurrencies through Bitbacker. I want to be able to bring you more content soon, so make sure to add your donations today to help make that happen. I have two new Apple podcast reviews this week. Philip P. said, The root has been struck. This podcast has been a great joy to listen to, either driving or at work. 
Roger's humor and delivery on hard-hitting topics make the news more palatable. Keep up the good work, Freedom Fighter. And Lewis Z said, I love this podcast. I've been listening to podcasts for a while, and this is one of the best. Roger's humor in dealing with serious topics is a breath of fresh air. Keep up the good work, sir. Guys, thank you both so much for those amazing reviews. I can't thank you enough for taking a couple of minutes to do that. You guys rock. If you have a minute and you want to hear your review read right here on the show, please go to thelavaflow.com slash apple and leave me a rating and a review. All the cool kids are doing it. Thank you to everyone who has left me a rating and a review so far. You guys rock. To all of you who haven't, can you guys help me out and go leave a review for me? Go to thelavaflow.com slash apple to do that now. Until next time, keep striking the root. Thank you for listening to The Lava Flow at thelavaflow.com. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe now at thelavaflow.com forward slash subscribe. This has been a Pax Libertas Productions podcast.